Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. I await his blog postings and news columns so I can reply with some devastating analysis or wicked repartee. He's predictably pro-business and anti-union. And in addition to raising my blood pressure, he makes me think. He's Greg David, a colleague of mine at both the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism and this semester at Baruch College. Greg writes a blog and weekly column for Crane's New York Business following a 25-year stint as the publication's editor. He's director of the Business and Economics Reporting Program at the CUNY Journalism School, and he's currently writing a book on the transformation of the New York economy over the past 30 years. Its title is Modern New York, Life and Economies of a City. Greg, welcome. Let's take our disagreements public. Thank you, First Doug. Of, I've, I've read all, I, uh, this is scary. I've read all your blog postings and columns for the last year. <laughs> so my blood pressure is high enough. Let's, let's, in a sense, walk through some of these. And there is a thematic connection here. You wrote and you asked the question on October 11th, is Andrew Cuomo, is he for real? Three months later, four months later, is Andrew Cuomo for real? And what does that mean? Well, he's so much for real that virtually every day he takes my breath away. Oh, and, my God, your breath! And I cannot believe what he's doing. The question was, is Andrew Cuomo, who has traditionally been a liberal Democrat, come from one of the most amazing liberal Democratic families in American politics, sincere about cutting the budget, sincere about cutting the size of government, sincere about a pro-economic growth agenda, and the answer is, to me, every day, he convinces me more that the answer is fundamentally yes. Who told you that on October 11th when he got that blog posting? You know, I, um, it wasn't a question of doing that, but I couldn't figure out at that point politically why he wouldn't be sincere. Right. You know, it was pretty clear by October and some of the things that happened in places like Pennsylvania that the worst thing to do these days as a politician is to change your point of view after an election. Mm -hmm. Used to be a lot of people would do that. Right. Today, it's like death. Right. So I thought that was the case. Also, I think, you know, it isn't an um, accident that Andrew Cuomo lives in Westchester now. And I think all those people who surrounded Mar Mario Cuomo as governor have, like, moved to the suburbs, pay extraordinary property taxes. <laughs> And have soured. Liberals are people who have, uh, you know, neocons are liberals who have been mugged analysis. And, um, you know, they've soured on what government has done and can do. And so I, I thought that that whole attitude um, was likely to have um, taken over. And lastly, you know, on the fundamentals, he's just right. And, 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 the, and the fact is that he, in some ways, he is a, a realist, and he's, ex he, what I'm seeing is he's exerting real leadership. I mean, he's, he's taken control of the game. He's redefined the game. Talk about this permanent campaign. He's got a huge war chest. He's got significant allies. He's on the stump. Is this a new way to govern? Uh, well, he's always been a good politician, right? So some of it's that. But I think you hit on the crucial point when you said redefine the game because he's redefined the conversation yep. in New York. Oh, he's created the narrative. It's no longer about we have a budget gap because of an economic problem. He says this is not about a budget gap. This is the fact that state government and government in New York is too large, too expensive, dragging down the economy and ineffective it was. And structurally does. totally imbalanced. So he says that it's not about closing a budget gap, it's about changing a what's up. Now, things have changed in New York. You know, people who were once so far outside the mainstream are now very much in the mainstream. For example, E.J. McMahon, who's been writing prolifically from his base at the Manhattan Institute for years about what's wrong in New York, uh, raised the issue of whether we should have defined pension plans for uh, 
public sector mm -hmm. workers or not, is now not far out of the mainstream either. Now we're going to talk. We want, I definitely want to get back to to pensions. Let's talk about Cuomo and the budget. And you and I have had this conversation on uh, January twenty fourth of this year. You wrote a piece, effective counters to deficit thinking, and you put you know you talk about a labor leader I know, a, poli a political scientist. Now let me quote: a political scientist I know keeps telling me there is no way Governor Cuomo and the legislature can actually cut ten billion dollars from the budget. Can he cut $10 billion from this year's budget? Yes. Wow. And, and of course, that's because he's changed the conversation. Right, now it's only a $1 billion budget. But he's gap. right about that. Here's what... I'm, I, I'm not arguing with right. that. He redefined the game. And you know what? I've been writing uh, pieces for years about the fact that cuts in government spending are not like what individuals do. If we're going to cut our spending, we look at what we're really spending this month and cut it from that level. Government cuts are from always what was expected to be spent. Now, and in this case, mandated by law to be spent. Mandated by law to be spent, irrespective of economic or other conditions. Or you need. Know, he points out, Cuomo and his people have pointed out, that education aid in New York was supposed to go up 13% this year under those mandated formulas. Well, how can we do that with such a difficult economy and especially with such difficult tax collection issues? So he's redefined the game. And I think that's made a big difference. He's laid out a plan to cut the budget. And he's actually cut the absolute number of dollars to be spent by the state, at least in this proposed budget, over what was proposed and spent last year. For the first time in a decade. Or more, perhaps. Okay. Now, how does he get to $10 billion? I want you to add up $10 billion and tell me, without taxes and without new borrowing, how does he get $10 billion, at least in, in that sense? Um, he, he, the two biggest cuts are $2.5 billion out of education aid and two, a little more than that out of Medicaid. Those are the two biggest targets. So that's about half of what he needs. Well, I think that's off of the base from last year, not from what is expected to be spent, because he's redefined the conversation. He's also going to sharply uh, constrict um, the state workforce. There are going to be layoffs. There are going to be lots of consolidations. So he's targeted these. This up to these, $10 billion? The budget's balanced that he submitted. Now we've got a legislature. What's, what's going to be, you know, look at the tea leaves. What's, what's the pol political dynamic here? Well, you know, that's very interesting because I can't figure it out entirely. First of all, you've got assembly. Well, if any of us could, we'd be worth a lot more than we are. Uh, well, we used to figure out that the assembly Democrats will find right. ways to increase it. And remember, the Republicans under Joe Bruno were not uh, fiscally I conservative. They just had slightly different priorities. No, they were just co-conspirators. Um, Shelley Silver says he recognizes the economic conditions. He knows that spending must be reduced, but there are children to educate and needy people who do need health care. The state Senate is, for the most part, full, controlled by the Republicans, for the most part, fully behind Cuomo, except that one issue in education spending is where should the cuts be made? Right. Should they fall heaviest, heaviest on the wealthy districts, i.e., all those Republicans on Long Island yep. district? Yep. And Westchester. Or they should be equal across yep. the board? Key question. And the Republicans in the, state, in the state Senate have so far said they want equal across the board. Um, uh, the third issue out there is that many people including many Assembly Democrats, a few Senate Democrats, want to continue the millionaire's tax, which, of course, in New York, only in New York, does a millionaire's tax begin at $300,000 in income. The millionaire's tax would, not, would be a help, but not a huge help this year, because it's already in existence for nine of the 12 months. It'd add about a billion dollars. And that's- well, Wait a minute a second. A billion dollars, if you do Cuomo's new math, the billion dollars closes the gap. So, don't do lies, damn lies, and statistics with me. Well, go ahead. Go it's ahead. a billion dollars. Um, Cuomo is adamant against it. The Republicans in the state Senate are adamant against it. Um, that's the one point where I think negotiations could ensue. Yeah. But here's the problem. Here's the Cuomo political perspective. Go ahead. It's the first year. He wants to take you all the pain yep, right you now. You got to do it. 
Now, if you extend the millionaire's tax, and not permanently, but let's say we extended it for the rest of the fiscal year, right. you would add a billion dollars to next year's budget problem. If you extended it for three months this year and all the next fiscal year, you'd build in a $5 billion problem whenever it expires. It produces about $5 billion a year. If it's going to So expire, don't let it expire. Well, I don't think Cuomo's going for a permanent extension under any circumstances. And anyway, it was supposed, you know, here's the thing about the budget that people really need to remember. Tell me. New York State, rec New York State received $14 billion in federal stimulus money for education and health care mm -hmm. over the last two years. That was supposed to provide a transition to what we could afford. It was methadone. It was substituting Absolutely. one addiction for another. Come on. Absolutely. Of course, you know, at the time, Obama had just been reelected. The Democrats controlled both houses of Congress. Everybody thought it might continue in indefinitely. Well, now there's no more stimulus. So Not we, to say that it wasn't, in some senses, very necessary in terms of stability, but go ahead. Well, my point is whether it was necessary. Right, or, of, it it there, wasn't used right. oh, I agree. to transition the state I agree. to a lower level. Now, the people who want to continue the millionaire's tax, uh, the labor leader you talked about in my um, piece said to me, we need, something te we need a temporary bridge so that all the pain isn't felt by working people. Well, we've had, two, we've had this $14 billion temporary bridge. When does temporary end, and when do we well, get to the Well, sometimes you need a lot place? of bridges. To what? Your we Venice. Have, this Come is the bridge to nowhere. Oh, yeah, I'll give you the bridge to nowhere. to nowhere. Okay, let's, let's talk about unions and pensions. In, in, uh, in, the, in the opening, I, 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 I guess I had you characterize unions as a bete noir or, of, uh, uh, of the narrative. The emerging narrative seems to be that public employees and their pensions are the problem. And they've become the bete noir of the story. And everybody's on this conventional wisdom. The mayor's on it. Cuomo's on it. Is there this conventional wisdom? And how wise is the wisdom? I know where you stand. But articulate your position. When Michael Bloomberg took office, pensions, the annual payment to the New York City pensions was $1.5 billion. Right. It's currently seven billion dollars. Right, and, and some of this be, is because of Mike Bloomberg. And it and could it be headed to thirteen? Well, most of it's because Bloomberg gave people big raises. All right, if and you now were, he's preaching, uh, you know, fiscal prudence over yeah. here. There's if, a little bit of hypocrisy here, maybe. If you work in the private sector, and even if you work at CUNY, by the way, you oh. don't have a defined benefit pension. Right, plan I have anymore. almost a four hundred one k. You said the DIA crap. That's what people have: four hundred one k's. Who are 401ks good for? They're good for people who change jobs a lot because you get the money, you keep and, it, and you keep building. And people who are related to the stock market because it's all based on right. bonds and stocks. Now, who are defined benefit pension plans left with? Public sector workers. And you know what? The mayor, people with public sector pensions can retire at age 55 a lot. The rest of us can't retire at age 55. They get... Retiree health insurance, the only group left that gets retiree health insurance in the whole wide world. And, of course, if you're a policeman or a fireman, you get out in 20 years with a half pension. And New York is one of three states in which overtime in the last year counts. If you happen to be one of these very lucky people in the private sector with a pension, your final pension payout will be determined by something like five of your highest paid years in the last 10. If you're a city employee, especially if you're a policeman or a fireman, your pension is determined by your final year's salary. So what do you do? You work an enormous you amount it of money. You with overtime. So your actual retiree pension okay. can be like 80% of your pension. Okay, I mean clearly... At age 45. Okay, okay. But there are clearly inefficiencies, inequities built into the system. What do you do without destroying what these workers have legitimately earned through their negotiations with uh, executives and legislators? Well, here's the kicker. We can't do anything about it because the Constitution of New York State, as interpreted by the courts, says all existing benefits are guaranteed. We can only start with new employees the savings are very small in the early years, but Absolutely. it's still something we have to do.
Now, now whether got, now whether go ahead. maybe other things we can do. It's unclear to me and unclear in in the research I've done whether retiree health insurance is protected. Okay. And we could do lots of things with retiree well, health insurance. Again, look into this this foggy crystal ball. You know, we're in April and they do have a budget sometime in April, maybe even May. Do you see any pension reform coming out of this? What what is politically in your mind palatable, conceivable. Well, Governor Cuomo told us a lot on Friday because he says he's not doing pension reform till the budget's done. So he's going to get a budget first and then tax yeah. pension reform. Yeah. Now, the politics of this are unclear to me because after he does a budget, what's his leverage? Um, David Patterson got a new pension tier, less cost right. pension tier, because he promised no layoffs. Right. Um, I so you're saying all the carrots and sticks will have been well, the expended state, the, or used? Well, I think the state carrots are gone. Now, the city carrots will still be around because the mayor's budget isn't concluded. Yeah, but the mayor can't do anything. I mean, in a sense, the mayor is... The mayor can trade layoffs for pension changes. Through contract, but he can't, he can't establish new, new tiers, for example. I mean, The legislature has to do it. Right. There could be a deal in which the mayor makes some concessions on layoffs in return for the union's cooperation. Okay, let's uh, let's let okay, let's talk. But here's what I think go, will go, happen. Go, go, go. Because there'll be so much pressure on local governments cuz I think we will pass a property tax cap, there will be a united coalition in Albany, Cuomo, Bloomberg, local school districts, local villages, local towns and counties in favor of pension reform and maybe that will make a difference. That's my guess as to what will happen. Okay. Let's 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 shift a little bit to this this Cuomo Bloomberg dynamic, one of both conflict and, and collaboration, as you just suggested. On the pension reform issue, there's collaboration, even though there's you know the details haven't been worked out with. But in terms of budget, uh-uh. I mean, there's trading insults. I don't know. You know, if you read the stories this morning, there weren't so many insults. Um, but there were the, insults. There, the mayor went out of his way to keep talking about the problem. As a matter of fact... Well, the mayor has to be nice because the governor's got the cards. And also, but the governor's saying all the things the mayor's been saying. Right, about right, right, right. Well, that's the, the, the cooperation. Now, you know, if you want to sort through this argument, it's all it's just where we started talking about. The mayor says the city's losing $2 billion because he's doing it from the money he expected to get right. from the state. Right, right. The, the Cuomo administration says you're losing $560 million in... Um, real dollars. Real dollars for education and a few hundred million dollars more in other things. But what the mayor is really saying is that he wants what's called mandate relief from government so he can manage the process better. And specifically, the issue has been the ability to fire teachers irrespective of seniority. That's, that's, the, his no that's the signal issue in this. Right. Talk about that. Well, we are going to have layoffs. We just don't know how many, probably many fewer than people are Of course, because you always exaggerate. But we are going to lay teachers off. And the question is whether we're going to lay off the last in, the youngest teachers we've hired, or we can lay people off based on their performance in the classroom. If, in fact, you can accurately measure performance, having been both a teacher and a member of a school board, there's a tremendous ab potential for abuse if you don't have a rigorous reporting system and performance. I have no is sympathy there, with well, this. Wait a minute. Yeah, but wait a second. Is there, you, you talk about these grandiose terms. Talk, how do you measure the performance? Is it measurable? Of course it is measurable as someone who has fired and laid off scores of people in my 25-year career. The fact of the matter We're is... Not te teachers? I mean, how oh, teachers you? are no different than uh, journalists or anyone else. Uh, bull, but and I ahead. am a teacher now. Well, yo, wait a second. I want to observe your class, Buster. My guest. I no, go ahead. Go ahead. I, let's not get Look, personal. it's no different than the private sector where people make decisions all the time. Um, about who gets laid off. And you know what? No, it's not a pristine process. And no, it's not always right because people make mistakes, you know, but that's the it's, way it's the world works. It's more than work. mistakes. It's active, intentional punishment or whatever. Come on. Smart principals are not going to get rid of good teachers 
because smart editors do not get rid of good reporters. Oh, oh wait a minute. Okay, wait, 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 wait. This smacks of By way, Bloomberg's Kathy Black argument that you can take someone who knows nothing, in a sense, about the substance of a field, and they, they can succeed. That's the argument. No, that's, I'm not making that, I mean, I'm saying the principals know who's a good teacher and who will help them uh, succeed in their job. And by the way, let's make sure, I, I'm not saying that every decision is made just on the basis of a quality of person, because we do know what happens in the private sector, and that is in the private sector, it is not unusual to lay off high paid people. Right. In order to yep. cut your costs more. Breakage. Or, or by the way, to maintain more people. Right. No, sometimes, I understand sometimes, that. Sometimes, I mean, they just did that at the Village Voice. They right. They got rid of their two highest paid, most well-known right. uh, reporters in order to preserve more I, jobs. I understand that. And then the question is, what is the quality of the output using such a rational decision-making process? And that is a lousier paper. Uh, I would say that the output is better than seniority-based layoffs. I don't disagree. I mean, I was a New York City public school teacher. I st I've been teaching for 30 years at the university. I agree. I mean, clearly, f last in, first height is ridiculous. But it's, it ain't easy to measure performance, and you've got to protect people from the ability of higher-ups to punish on non-professional grounds. I mean, it's a legitimate concern. It's almost impossible to measure. There is no objective criteria to measure reporter performance. It's as subjective as you get, and yet my whole life I've been measuring reporter performance. Okay, and you're assuming it's trans. Okay, let's move yes, on. I, it's, I, 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 it's a profession. Mm, mm. Okay, we'll, we'll move on. Let's argue about something else. Walmart. What's the issue here? Oh well, there are a million different oh, well, issues I, here. You only have five minutes. Five so minutes. Do two minutes worth. The opponents of Walmart say um, they will destroy small businesses. They will ruin neighborhoods. Um, they will drive down wages in New York. They also say something else that's very significant, and this is what the speaker Christine Quinn says. Go ahead. It's too bad of a. We should keep. They're such a nasty, awful, uh, illegally oriented company. We should keep them. Okay. Out of New so York. you made four points. Uh, is there empirical evidence to buttress the critics' claims? There. I don't believe there's any real empirical evidence on jobs. Walmart destroyed small businesses in the South when it put its big stores yep. on the outside yep. of the city. Yep, 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 yep. That has no relevance to today's urban, um, urban city experience. Secondly, uh, is it a terrible company? I don't know. You look at towns like Oneonta where you- Wait, wait I'm talking about New York City, oh, Chicago, okay, no, Boston. Okay. Oh, places oh, just like big that. cities. Big okay, city, okay. Big cities. Okay. Because um, there's a qualitative difference be because of size? Um, because of the way cities operate, because other businesses are... Okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. The most important point, why should New York, is New York so unique that we alone in the, practically the entire country can keep Walmart out? Two, how is Walmart different than Target, Kohl's, all the, Home Depot, all these other stores? Do they have big corporate reps too? No, Target does not. It's one of the great fascinating stories. Target um, is just like Walmart, except it has much better PR and a much better corporate rep. As on the small business issue, why will Walmart drive out small, hurt small businesses where Target and Home Depot have so not? So this seems to be, ta you're arguing that this is specifically focused on Walmart as a particular firm rather than... Absolutely. We've got every one of its competitors in New York. Okay. Okay. Just. just and by the way, what oh, they don't say is that the Walmart pays more than places like Target. And by the way, uh -oh. Walmart pays just as much as the unionized supermarkets, which are leading the fight. And these are all empirically verifiable facts. Yes, and if the reporters would do a better job on the story, except for the New York Post, they haven't gone out and do those stories. Oh, and last, why? Is, oh, oh, here, here we and go. why is and why is Walmart so dangerous? Only because it's so successful, because its prices are so low. Who will benefit from Walmart's low prices and quality goods? But if it's that good, we're consumers. Gonna, it's going to draw people away from existing businesses. So let's just stop. absolutely okay, okay. But that's capitalism. That's right. the marketplace. Okay, CUNY J School. After all this time in the private sector, you're teaching full time. You're running the business. But what? Talk to me about CUNY J School and and what what it's about. I love the CUNY J School because it's just like Cranes in the 1980s and 90s, an upstart out to make its name. Ooh, go ahead. Um, you know, people come by the J School all the time. Like one of those two reporters I talked 
laughed about at the Village Voice and said to one of my colleagues, how can you do this? I.e., how can you train journalists with the world going to, when the media world going to hell in mm -hmm. the basket? It's not. Go ahead. It's changing. The Talk media me. world is changing. Well, New York Times did this great story the other day about the websites, including Politico, which are going to change the nature of coverage yep. of the 2012 presidential they, They've campaign. already changed it. Politico has 200 employees, 200 working journalists putting that site out. The world's changing. There are lots of new opportunities, lots of new web-based journalism operations. It's, the world is not going to hell in a handbasket. It's just changing. Every day I get on my train to come into the city and there's another iPad and another Kindle and that's where people are reading their newspapers and their books. It's just where we read is changing and the business model is changing. We think we're in the forefront of all this at the CUNY J School. I got a lot of really bright kids. And they're not so kids, they're, they're young people in their 20s, sometimes their early 30s and they're going to be the new wave of journalists and I am confident about the future. Ooh, excellent, thank you. Thanks to Greg David for being on the show. Look forward to seeing you next week. Hello, I'm Doug Musio. Let us know what you think about this show. You can reach us at cuny.tv. When you get there, click on the bar that says contact us and send your email. Whatever it is, thanks, no thanks, obnoxious, do it. Send it.